When this teenage girl collapsed by the poolside, paramedics were called to her aid. There wasn't any urgency, there wasn't any contact between the paramedics. Her parents thought she'd be in safe hands, but the paramedics were out of their depth. When this woman was attacked, this paramedic did nothing. Negligence. How can we ever live with that? Just how good are Britain's paramedics? In real life, as on the TV drama Casualty, paramedics are the shock troops of the health service. Eleven years ago, we were promised a paramedic on every ambulance. But the reality doesn't always match Casualty's ideal. At the very least, paramedics don't improve your chances of survival in serious trauma. Some of those who've seen them in action are losing their confidence. He's, yeah, his pulse is up and he's sweating. Oh, I'd be really, really worried. If, if I had to call out a paramedic, I really would. Right, my partner's outside. You go and tell her cardiac arrest. She'll know what to do. Anybody suggesting we're doing it differently is seen as, a, as an immense threat. I think it's been one huge success story, the development of the ambulance service in this country. On you go. My back is the problem. I trust him, he's a paramedic. Away from the world of TV drama, that trust is sometimes misplaced. Tonight, Panorama reveals that shortcomings in the ambulance service and its paramedics' lack of training are costing thousands of lives each year. At the same time, huge regional differences between the treatments paramedics give mean your chances of surviving a heart attack or a car crash may well depend on where you live. The girls were very close, they, they did lots of things together. For all there was a 10 year age difference, Katie loved to go off shopping with Hayley and she loved having Hayley's friends around. Hayley Turnbull and her baby sister Kate lived in Durham. At 15, Hayley seemed fit and healthy, but her life was about to hang on the skills of two paramedics. Anything to do with the water, she loved it. She actually started swimming lessons at a very early age. She was very confident in the water. On the 2nd of March 1995, Hayley went to a life-saving class. But she was about to face her own emergency for real. Her parents lived just minutes away. They were phoned by the baths and told Hayley had collapsed. They rushed to be with her. Mrs Turnbull was stopped from going to her daughter, but her husband was let through. He found himself confronted by a horrifying sight. Hayley was on the poolside, unconscious, being given mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation by the life-saving instructor. There were also two paramedics, who weren't treating Haley at all, but carrying in equipment. 11, 12, 13, 14, I hadn't been there very long, when I didn't feel things were right. The only person at the time treating Haley was the poolside trainer. I think my first reaction, Janice, was to come out and say to you, um, Haley's dying in there and they're not doing anything about it. There wasn't any urgency, there wasn't any contact between the paramedics. It appeared they were just carrying equipment. Their own official report reveals the paramedics thought Haley was having an asthma attack, although her parents had told them she had no history of asthma. In fact, she'd suffered a cardiac arrest. Quite why, we still don't know. Every second counted. She needed immediate electric shocks from a defibrillator. Her life was ebbing away. It took eight minutes for the paramedics to arrive. Another eight minutes went by before they used their monitor and saw her heart had stopped. Haley was starting to go blue, her lips were going blue. And I said to one of the, the, the ambulance people, she needs oxygen, she needs air, she's, she's not breathing. First they wasted time trying to pass a tube into her lungs to give her oxygen. They'd carried two defibrillators to the poolside, but now they decided it would be too dangerous to use them because of the water. I had the, the impression that we'd phone 999, that the paramedics were there. They were the cavalry. He would be the people that would come and save Haley's life. 
and I expected them to take over. But the longer time went on, that just didn't happen. They moved Haley to the foyer. There was no water there, but they still didn't shock her heart. It wasn't until they reached the ambulance that they used a defibrillator, at least 24 minutes after the 999 call. It didn't work. Doctors finally restarted her heart in hospital, but it was too late. Deprived for so long of oxygen, her brain had been fatally damaged. As a later inquiry confirmed, the paramedics had first misdiagnosed her, then failed to give her the treatment she needed. If they'd assessed the, the situation immediately and moved Haley to the ambulance, hopefully that would have happened much, much quicker. And, you know, consultants have told us that that, that would have given Haley a much, much improved chance of survival. And it was probably on the Sunday that they withdrew, withdrew the sedation and um, said that she was actually brain dead at that point. Malcolm Turnbull cannot but dwell on the mistakes that were made and wonder whether his daughter might have lived. If there isn't a day goes by, then, then I think of Haley. I think, what if? What if I put her in a car and take her to the hospital? What if the paramedics had been better trained, better qualified? Would Haley still have been here? And that's a question I continue to ask myself. Haley's death was investigated by the health service ombudsman, who was highly critical. But the paramedics kept their jobs. The local ambulance service said it had learned valuable lessons and changed its clinical practice. If the paramedics who treated Haley Turnbull had been better trained, perhaps they might have realised what was wrong with her more quickly and so saved her life. Here in Bristol, where the BBC series Casualty is filmed, I asked people what they knew about paramedics and how much training they thought they received. What do you know about paramedics? Uh, I've seen them on Casualty. Uh, they're highly trained. Um, they have motorbikes and ambulances. And God forbid, if I have an accident, they'll save my life. How much training would you imagine paramedics actually get in real life? Hopefully an extra um, two years. I would imagine it's similar to doctors, several years training to do it. A couple of years. Nearly as much, not as much as like um, a doctor, but about as much as like a nurse or something. Three years, at least I thought. The reality is rather surprising. After at least a year on the road as a technician, basically a driver qualified in first aid, the trainee paramedic gets just six weeks in the classroom, followed by a few weeks' experience in hospital. What's your reaction? I'd be shocked. And if I ever do have a road accident, I hope there's someone more trained than a paramedic. I'm surprised. Yeah, I would have thought it was a lot more than that, considering what they have to do out and about. Um, they haven't got any of the backup of the hospital staff or anything like that when they're out there. They're on their own, aren't they? Gosh, they're so important. That's incredible. Professor John Nicholl heads one of the country's leading medical research teams. The author of several reports on ambulance care, some of his findings make worrying reading. I think the public probably think that paramedics are better trained than nurses, whereas the opposite is true. Most paramedics only get uh, four to eight weeks of theoretical training, followed by a similar period of uh, practical training, followed by a year on the road when they, they, they're working as paramedics, but they are trainees uh, still. Nurses, on the other hand, usually do a three-year course, which is a mixture of practical and classroom uh, training, but it does go on for three years, so this is really quite a different uh, uh, degree of training. Is there anybody else in the health service who has to make a life-or-death decision about what to do with a patient who's only got four weeks training in the classroom? Uh, well, nowhere else in the health service, I think, uh, would that uh, would that happen? And the consequence of the fact that it does happen must be that some people die who otherwise might live. Yes, I, I'm sure that that is uh, a consequence. The only thing is that we know that it is surprisingly rare. The Ambulance Service Association, which represents the service nationally, insists there's no real problem, but it accepts there's room for improvement. Paramedic training today 
is very robust and provides an infinite improvement in care over the last decade. What we are saying is that there is growing evidence to suggest that the role of the paramedic can be further enhanced. So you do accept the evidence that things aren't quite as good as they might be? I say there are limited evidence to suggest that we can improve things, and that's natural. Another doctor who's researched the state of pre-hospital medicine is Charles Deakin. He's also disturbed by what he's found and is convinced that paramedics need more training. Generally, it's been assumed that uh, the standard of care that's been delivered in the pre-hospital environment has been adequate and that casualties are delivered to the hospital with everything possible having been done for them. Over the last 10 years, though, there's been quite a lot of research that has brought this into question. Thank you. I think in terms of what we're asking them to deal with uh, and the severity of injuries, then a, a significantly longer training, certainly more than the six to eight weeks than they have already, would be appropriate for uh, paramedics who are being asked to deal with, with seriously injured patients on the roadside. It would certainly improve their diagnostic skills and, and the skills in terms of treatment that they offer. Is he just ask him if he's got time to in this exercise at the National Fire Brigade Training Center, a paramedic with many years' experience directs the other emergency services. In reality, things don't always go so smoothly. The first thing a paramedic has to do is to ensure the patient can breathe properly, that their airway is clear, vital to prevent brain damage. Research suggests that paramedics aren't as good at this fundamental part of their job as they should be. More than half of those taken to hospital with serious injuries arrive with some airway obstruction. These results have, have been quite surprising really. Everyone has assumed that uh, airway management has been optimal on the roadside. People are now beginning to look at whether the airway skills that paramedics are taught are adequate. Sometimes the only way to help both heart attack and accident victims breathe is to put a plastic tube down their windpipe. Anaesthetists also do this in hospital when they give a general anaesthetic. It's oh, called better, intubation. Right. This is the view that you see as you look into the back of the mouth to insert the tube into the trachea, the windpipe. And then you can see the soft pink tissue beneath that, which is the epiglottis, which covers the windpipe. And then underneath that are the vocal cords. And it's that structure through which we try and pass the endotracheal tube. Unfortunately, with trauma patients, uh, often the view is, is not, not as good as this, and often... So it's actually more difficult, because of the angle of the head, often, to intubate by the roadside than it is in hospital. And doing it on the roadside is a lot more difficult. Anaesthetists aren't allowed to intubate patients until they've done it at least a hundred times under supervision. Paramedics, on the other hand, will go out on the road after just 20 practice attempts you ask who can deliver an intubation in an upturned car at night, then it's the paramedic who can, and it's the anaesthetist who can't. The training really does show that the paramedics are capable of doing that, and they perform the intubations day in and day out very successfully. But what you're telling me is that paramedics are just better at intubating patients than anaesthetists? In the pre-hospital setting. Well, that's an interesting view. I would be surprised that if someone who had done 20 intubations, whether they were an anaesthetist or a paramedic, was better than someone who was doing it every day of their life. An NHS study in 1998 found that more than a third of intubations attempted by paramedics failed. Yet in Britain, only doctors, not paramedics, are trained to intubate a group of patients who often need it most. People with head injuries who aren't completely unconscious. Trying to insert a tube will make them choke and vomit. Yet without intubation, they will suffer brain damage. The only patients in terms of trauma that they can intubate successfully really are those with what we call a Glasgow Coma Scale of 3. That's patients who are completely unresponsive. And patients who are completely unresponsive from trauma um, have a very, very poor outcome. Probably less than 2 or 3 percent survive. The only trauma patients that paramedics can intubate are generally those that are dead. The only way to intubate semi-conscious patients is to give them anaesthetics and muscle-relaxing drugs to dampen their gag reflex. Let's look at the screen. 
stand clear. In America, where most paramedics are trained for two years, they can give these drugs. Giving their British counterparts these skills might have dramatic results. If you can intubate patients on the roadside with a head injury, then you make a big difference in terms of whether they survive or not. You're probably looking at somewhere in the region of 600 to 1,000 patients who could have survived. If a paramedic fails to diagnose an injured patient correctly, the consequences can be fatal. My mother was very good with children, and if somebody was ill, she'd go around and see them. Janet Delaney was a healthy woman of 58. She lived in Derby with her daughter, Kelly, not far from her son, Patrick, and his family. On 9th July last year, she popped out to collect her wages from the local pub where she worked. I was speaking to my mum about different things, um, and she seemed okay, she seemed fine. Um, she seemed happy, and then I went upstairs to have a bath. So I'd arranged to go out that night with a friend. While Mrs Delaney went out, a few streets away, Nicole Beresford was getting her children ready for bed. She knew Mrs Delaney by sight. I came downstairs and I noticed there was a bit of commotion in the street. So I went outside to have a look because I thought somebody would knock my cat over and then realised it was Mrs Delaney lying in the road and she looked like she'd fallen backwards or somebody dragged her backwards. To begin with, we, we all felt that she'd been mugged or she'd been attacked or of some such sort because she always carries a black bag with her and she'd got no black bag with her and the contents of perhaps what would have been in a bag were all sort of thrown all round her body. Nicole noticed what looked like blood on the back of Mrs Delaney's head. She appeared to be unconscious and began to vomit. A passing driver dialed 999. First on the scene was a paramedic in a rapid response car, Brenda Blood. The ambulance service thought highly of her and had chosen her to appear in this TV documentary about the job of a paramedic. She saw Mrs Delaney and her response was, oh, she's drunk, um, she's not a very nice person, I know her, um, and she's drunk. Um, and we were all quite shocked because she hadn't made any examination. Yeah. All she kept repeating was, no, she's drunk. And then the paramedic um, put some surgical gloves on and got onto the floor and slapped Mrs Delaney across the face a couple of times. Um, to ask her to get up. Mrs Delaney lay in the street for half an hour until an ambulance arrived. Brenda Blood told them to go away. In fact, Mrs Delaney was sober. She'd drunk only a pint of lager hours earlier. But the paramedic called the police and asked them to deal with her. How long in all was the paramedic in the road with Mrs Delaney before she was finally taken away? It was well over an hour before the police arrived and, and took her well over an hour. And in that hour, did at any stage the paramedic examine Mrs Delaney? No, not once. The only time the paramedic went near Mrs Delaney was to remove her teeth and slap her face, and that was it. Brenda Blood told the police that Mrs Delaney was drunk, and they took her home. Her daughter was there to meet her. My mum got out of the police car and she seemed really confused. She didn't know where she was. She was disorientated. She seemed really strange. Um, and the policeman said that she'd had a few too many. Assuming she needed to sleep it off, Kelly left her mother on the sofa and went out. Mrs Delaney had arranged to meet a friend that evening. When she failed to turn up, he went to her house and let himself in. He saw at once she was in a critical condition and called another ambulance which did take her to hospital. Did you see her in hospital? I got there two minutes after she'd died. Mrs Delaney died from a fractured skull. Two men have been charged with her murder. The ambulance service refused to comment to Panorama, saying the case is sub judice. A few weeks after Mrs Delaney's death, ambulance officials agreed to talk to her family, only to cancel the meeting an hour before it was due to start. 
Brenda Blood, the paramedic, has been suspended pending a disciplinary hearing. She's gone through that attack and then the people that have come to save her treat her and call her a drunk, slander and negligence. How can we ever live with that? A recent study by Professor Nickel assessed whether being treated by paramedics improved patients' chances of surviving serious injury. The conclusions were surprising. The findings in that report were that there was a higher mortality amongst patients treated, uh, uh, tr uh, patients with serious injuries treated by paramedics than similar patients uh, managed by non-paramedics. He assembled a panel of experts who looked at 179 cases where paramedics treated people who died from injuries. They tried to assess whether these deaths were avoidable. And they thought that 17 of these patients who were attended by paramedics could possibly, their lives possibly could have been uh, saved. But when they looked in detail and thought about everything that had been done, they finally concluded that eight of them had probably avoidable death. So one in 10 might possibly have lived, almost one in 20 probably could have done. Professor Nichols says similar numbers die avoidably in hospital too, but the Ambulance Service Association seems unperturbed. And trauma cases themselves represent less than 10% of the demand that is placed upon emergency ambulance services. The incidences are tragic, they are certainly regrettable, but it is important that we learn from them. But then to suggest that those few isolated incidents undermine the quality of the training delivered in this country, I, I think is perhaps an insult to the service. Across the UK, there are 36 ambulance services. Each has its own treatment instructions laid down by committees of doctors known as clinical protocols. We've carried out a survey of some of these protocols and found wide discrepancies. This is No Man's Heath, where four counties and three ambulance services meet, East Midlands, Staffordshire and Warwickshire. If you find yourself here dying from heart failure and someone dials 999, you'd better hope the ambulance comes from Warwickshire. Their paramedics, and theirs alone, can give you a shot of a life-saving heart drug, ferruzamide, and also the best drug available for relieving your pain, diamorphine. On the other hand, if you were lying in a smashed up car with a punctured lung, your best hope would be an ambulance from Staffordshire, where all paramedics learn a life-saving technique to keep you breathing, needle decompression. And East Midlands, well, most of their paramedics couldn't give you any of these treatments. Then again, the chances of the ambulance coming from East Midlands are fairly small. Their response times are much slower. Some of the biggest differences between services concern drugs. One example is Warwickshire. OK, these are some of the drugs that we carry that other ambulance services don't. We've got fruzamide for relief of patients suffering from left ventricular failure. Now what's that? It's a drug that helps uh, remove some of the fluids uh, when people have given it, they've got bubbling on their lungs and it basically gets the whole system on the move again. I, I mean, is that really a life-saving drug? It can be a life-saving drug, yes, certainly. When people go a long way down the road, they, they're almost drowning by the time we get there. Last year, Warwickshire paramedics gave fruzamide to 140 patients. Yet our survey reveals only five ambulance trusts give this drug across the country. When Derbyshire, Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire merged to form East Midlands last April, one of them, Nottinghamshire, had been using the drug. But after the merger, it wasn't extended to the other areas, while in Nottinghamshire, it was actually restricted. Here's a drug. You use it in part of your service area, not in the rest of it. It seems absolutely baffling. But at the end of the day, I have to be responsible and accountable for what happens out on the road. Um, and I'm accountable for the drugs and the authorisation at the end of the day. But you can give that authorisation in Nottinghamshire. You're saying you can't in Derbyshire Leicester. It I makes no sense. I can't give that authorisation. Well, your committee... The authorisation comes from the medical committee that I've uh, been talking about. But where's the logic? They've authorised it for use in Nottinghamshire. It doesn't take a lot of training to train paramedics to use this drug. Perhaps a day at best. It's not in use in Derbyshire Leicester. Where's the logic? And I'm sorry, that's, I'm not going any further with that. Uh, okay. Treatments available for trauma patients are just as uneven. 
Here on casualty, paramedics save a patient with a punctured lung by relieving the pressure in his chest, a procedure known as needle decompression. Josh, I'm out of my league here, mate. You're doing fine, mid-clavicular line. In reality, only half the 36 ambulance services can do it. If I was trapped in a car crash with a collapsed lung, then I wouldn't want it to be in a county where the paramedics weren't trained in that procedure. It's a life-saving procedure, and if it wasn't performed, then the outcome may well be death. Get the the Ambulance Service Association says it exists to promote best practice of the kind seen on casualty. It doesn't always succeed. Currently it's variable and I, th I think it's that variability that we has been a strength. But also that strength has got to make sure that everybody has advantage to best practice. And at the moment they don't? No, some services don't. Use certain skills, use certain drugs. Use best practice? They don't use best practice at the moment. This isn't the only area where the ASA is failing to improve national standards. This is Roger Thane, Chief Executive of the Staffordshire Service. Thane's carried out radical reforms. By focusing on times and places of peak demand, he's cut response times and saved money, which he's invested in extra training. It's made him unpopular. I've, I've felt like the public enemy number one of the ASA at times. Trojan 384. The government has set a target for all ambulance services. By March next year, they must get to 75% of emergencies within eight minutes. So far, only Staffordshire has met this target. None of the others come close. In Staffordshire, Thane and his other managers don't just drive their desks. They drive ambulances when necessary. The driver of the car was actually going very, very slowly. Others don't seem ready for this change. I think uh, a lot of them are very reluctant to change uh, and are in a time warp of well, we've always done it this way and we haven't seen it done any differently. Uh, and anybody suggesting we're doing it differently is seen as, a, as an immense threat. Instead of waiting in stations far from where emergencies occur, Staffordshire crews use forward posts Rooms for crews to wait in, rented on housing estates or petrol stations, where and when they're likely to be most needed. The resulting faster response has saved hundreds of lives, especially of patients in cardiac arrest. Well, I think it's best if you've got a bit of chest pain to go and get it checked out properly, especially if you have had a heart attack in the last four weeks. It's always best to get it looked at. In 1992, Staffordshire's cardiac arrest survival rate was no more than the national average. 2% of patients were resuscitated and taken alive to hospital. Now, that figure is 11%. OK. Ready? Okay. Two, three. If the ambulance service in the whole of England managed to achieve that level of improvement, how many lives might be saved a year? Approximately 7,000. Uh, more people would ar arrive with a chance of survival at hospital. Of those 7,000 people who are now dying, up to a half could expect to walk out of hospital within a week. I think it's going to go slow, Iris. Mm -hmm. Thane's figures are backed by the academics. Staffordshire are, are top of the table. Uh, they're the sort of the Manchester United. But we're still hopeful that if the ambulance services can move there, which Staffordshire have already achieved, then uh, over the whole country, as you say, several thousand lives will be saved, and that really will be uh, some achievement. Have you taken some tablets? How many? Thane has managed to impress the Department of Health, which has now commissioned Professor Nicholl to conduct a study of how Staffordshire achieves its results and how they may be more widely applied. The ASA is less impressed. In what aspect of best practice happens in Staffordshire that is not happening in part or in whole in any other service? Could you identify which ones? He's met the 2001 response target for the last four years. No other ambulance service has yet done so. He's reported them, yes. But his figures have been audited independently, haven't they? But by certain people, yes. 
Well, they've been independently audited. Yeah. You can't, you can't well, say that they've fiddled, surely. No, there are, there are good practices there. No precedent that the ASA has ever visited. Now, you're the vice president of the ASA. Have you been to Staffordshire and had a look at what they're up to? I'm certainly aware, fully aware of what, Have you been there? what Staffordshire. No, I certainly haven't. No they're just up the road, aren't they? About 30 miles from here. Very, very much so. I think that uh, they are considered to be very egoistic, uh, dogmatic, uh, dangerous, provocative. If I said to you that others in the ASA have described Roger Thane as something of a maverick, and, that, and if I made the comment that he seems to be slight, slightly isolated in the ASA, do you think that would be fair? That could well be a view that's held by a number of comments. It's a, it's, a, it's a view of the individuals within the association, not the association's view itself. When paramedics make mistakes, bereaved families, like that of Morris Webster, a pensioner from Leicester, feel they're much less accountable than other health professionals. He only lived and worked to take his children on holiday and then his grandchildren came along and he just lived for them. Mr Webster's love of life and energy concealed the fact that by the autumn of 1998 he'd had three heart attacks. He'd been told to go to hospital immediately if he experienced any symptoms suggesting a recurrence. His daughter, Lynn Harper, was with him on the evening of the 28th of October. She was soon worried about his health. He had pains in his chest and arms, shortness of breath, and was covered in a cold sweat. An angina pill made no difference. A trained first aider, she feared the worst, and called an ambulance. It arrived within ten minutes. So when the ambulance arrived at his door, how did you feel as you saw the crew arrive? Relieved that I'd got my dad in safe hands. Two ambulancemen, a technician and paramedic Ian Wiltshire, went in. They failed to assess or treat Mr Webster. First of all, one of the paramedics sat straight down into the armchair without speaking and sat back slumped in the armchair watching the television. And there he stayed. Sat there tapping his cheek, wiggling his feet. For almost 40 minutes, paramedic Wiltshire did nothing. Meanwhile, Mr Webster's condition was deteriorating. Lynn's daughter, Jane Milankovic, arrived. Eventually, Jane says, as if spurred by boredom, the paramedic examined Mr Webster. When they did finally put the equipment on him, um, blood pressure, ECG. They started to give each other alarming looks. He stopped watching TV, the one in the chair. He looked at his colleague, his colleague looked back. They still didn't speak. They still didn't say a word to each other. And within seconds, he'd stood up. Right, we'll get you to hospital, straight to hospital. His family never saw him alive again. Mr Webster died soon after reaching hospital. His family feel his death was avoidable. We could have got him in the car ourselves, got him to hospital far more quicker than they had. We could have actually walked to a bus stop, got him on a bus and got him the treatment quicker. And if you had, he might still be alive. He may well be. Not long after the funeral, they were sent an anonymous letter from a group of ambulance staff, which confirmed their suspicions. We received a fax from our solicitor, an ambulance-headed note paper, um, stating their disgust at the crew that night, how they felt that this crew was letting the ambulance service down. Lynn and Jane made a complaint asking questions about the paramedic's failure to treat Mr Webster. There was a disciplinary hearing, but the family weren't told its outcome. They knew that the paramedic had kept his job. I can't tell you what disciplinary action was taken against the crew. I have a responsibility of confidentiality as far as the crew is concerned, as I have a responsibility for confidentiality as far as patients are concerned. Disciplinary action has been taken against that paramedic, and that paramedic has been subject to uh, considerable retraining. Drinking while on duty, 
and stealing from your employer, they're all dismissible offences. But there's no clarification on what they can do or not do to the public for fear of losing the job. It just seems that they can get away with so much. That, however, is set to change. Well, just have a go on the A5 on today, come straight across, uh, just come across it, over. Last year, Parliament agreed to make paramedics a state registered profession, like nurses. Under the new register, they could be struck off for professional misconduct. But this is at least 18 months from coming into force. The new register will be run by a board under the Council for Professions Supplementary to Medicine. Its registrar says that for six months, the Department of Health did nothing to set the register up, failing even to agree the names for the board. At the end of last year, they began to act. What do you think suddenly made events start to move again? I believe it could well have been um, this programme being made. They would have felt embarrassed if there hadn't been the names after such a long delay, knowing that we were about to broadcast a panorama. I don't know, but certainly I, your, your, the name of this programme was mentioned when uh, a contact was made between the NHSC and ourselves. And in what context? What did they say? Asking when the board was to be formed, and we were told why the board could not be formed, because we had not got approval of the two names we needed for council from the paramedics. So the DOH contacted you and said, Panorama's going out with a programme about paramedics, why is there no board? And you had to point out that they had to make the next move. That's correct. <laughs> the new board will have other powers. For example, it could insist on better training. For bereaved families like the Turnbulls, whose younger daughter, Katie, now attends a life-saving class like Hayley did, the need seems clear. I think we have to look very closely at, at what we are asking paramedics to do. We're asking them to take over from doctors. We're asking them to make decisions that doctors make. Yet we only give them six weeks training. I think it's very unfair to put that much pressure on paramedics. The ASA also accepts there's a need for reform. As an interim step, it wants to introduce a slightly longer training syllabus of the kind already used here in Staffordshire. And looking further ahead, it wants to create a new grade of super paramedic with degrees. The problem is, unlike doctors or nurses, whose training is funded centrally, ambulance services have to pay for training their staff. No one knows where the extra money for these improvements may come from. If that's the objectives of the ambulance service in the United Kingdom, then we need to ensure that we set up a financial framework in which to ensure that that training takes place. So what you're saying is you have an emerging concept of improving ambulance training, but you don't know who's going to pay for it. Quite right. There's a lot of questions still to be asked. Meanwhile, lives that might be saved are being lost. What we could do is, is make sure that Haley didn't die in the end, that we can learn from her death, that we can get a better ambulance service, and maybe someone else won't have to go through what we've had to go through. You can comment on the issues raised in tonight's programme by visiting our website at bbc.co.uk slash panorama. Next week, working mothers, are they being forced back to the kitchen sink? Before we'd even got to the second bit. <laughs>